tonight's talk. The Mariner's Museum connects people to the world's waters because through the waters, through our shared maritime heritage, we're connected to one another. We connect people to the world's waters because through the waters, we're connected to one another. I'm gonna say it over and over and over again. The good news is, is that little high level of abstraction there, uh, that unobjectionable language actually is starting to mean something to folks. I'm starting to have the city manager of Newport News, others parrot those words back uh, to me and starting to talk about Newport News and Hampton Roads as this place that's bound together by water. But it's true of our nation. We're a maritime nation, right? All the major metropolitan areas in our country have a maritime hook to them, right? Even in the interior, St. Louis and Chicago, things like this. This is a big mission though, and it's not a mission that the Mariner's Museum can do on its own. If we're starting to tell a national story about how we're bound together as a, you know, through the water, uh, we need partners. We need a lot of partners. And one of the most exciting things for me since I've been at the Mariner's Museum is to develop a relationship with Dave Albert and his team and the folks at the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. And all of you know that that started around the Monitor, but that we've really grown that over the last year. We now have a NOAA exhibit telling the broader NOAA story uh, sitting here uh, right as to, to meet all of our, our uh, visitors to the museum. Last winter, we started to talk a little bit about the um, the work that the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary folks are doing with respect to the Battle of the Atlantic. And tonight is the next great step for us to try to be a, a, a mouthpiece, to try to be an amplifier for the great work that the, that the National Marine Sanctuary Program is doing to preserve our nation's maritime heritage. And in that, we've got Jeff Gray, the superintendent of the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary here to talk to us tonight. Um, Jeff has been the superintendent at Thunder Bay since 2002. In that capacity, he also oversees the Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center. Um, he's also very active in conservation efforts really across uh, Michigan and the upper Midwest there. Uh, and before he was at the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, Jeff was the state underwater archaeologist at the Wisconsin Historical Society which I think means that you are the archaeologist of underwater things. It doesn't mean you are an underwater archaeologist, right? Is it? Yeah. All right, so with that, please join me in welcoming uh, Jeff for a, what's going to be a really great talk tonight. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Uh, it is an absolute honor to, to be here tonight. Uh, as a historian, archaeologist, uh, this place is, it, 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 to make, you make pilgrimages to this place. And so I, I've been here many times as a student, uh, as a fan of maritime history, but so to come speak here is truly a special honor. And I had uh, the privilege of spending some time with Howard and the energy that he brings to, to history and to conservation and preservation is amazing. It's infectious, so thank you. Howard, for, for your time, and I'm glad you used the word connection, because that's something that I'd like to talk quite a bit about today as well, and how, we're, how we are all connected uh, by water, and how that's kind of forgotten a little bit today by some places. And so what I'm going to talk about is uh, a little bit about uh, the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary um, and, and the incredible uh, resources there. There's about 200 historic shipwrecks that are preserved by the cold, fresh water of Lake Huron. Uh, but what I want to do more than that is talk about how the connections to that sanctuary, the connection to that lake, uh, the connection to those waterways is really changing a community. And uh, the communities around the Great Lakes, very similar to here, grew up because of those waterways. And I really want to talk about how these resources, how these historic resources are still relevant to us today and how we're making more connections to those so we can basically have a higher quality of life uh, in, in our communities. Um, before I do that, though, I need to talk a little bit about the National Marine Sanctuaries. And um, people often don't know what the heck a National Marine Sanctuary is. And so uh, what we are, we're a system of 14 sites across the, the globe. And I say across the globe because we go all the way to the other side of the equator to American Samoa with the site there, sites up and down the California coast. Uh, Papahana Mukea in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands is over 100,000 square miles. And what we do is we protect America's 
uh, ocean and Great Lakes treasures. Uh, if you notice, Thunder Bay, perfectly situated in the middle of the country there, is the, currently the only site uh, in, in the Great Lakes. But there are two new sites that we're working on designating, one in Wisconsin and one in Mallows uh, Bay uh, in Maryland. Uh, and as you look at these images, you can see how incredible these resources that we are protecting. But the way we protect them is through connections. We are, you see people in these images. We're not protecting them by cutting them off from people. We're protecting them by creating connections to people so they can better appreciate these resources and preserve them for future generations. What I want to focus on today is Thunder Bay. Um, we you all know about the USS Monitor, the very first sanctuary. Thunder Bay was the 13th sanctuary, and it protects a collection of these 200 historic shipwrecks. And what's incredibly unique about them is the diversity of them, where the Monitor is special because of that one ship, that one ship that did so much and defined what, what our military became later. What this collection is, it's a collection that really defines Great Lakes history from the very beginning uh, to modern times, and they're preserved by that cold, fresh water. We're incredibly fortunate that some of these sites are in very shallow water so we can access them, and with some in very deep water so they're magnificently preserved intact. Um, but I want to start with the beginning. And in 2000, the sanctuary was designated as a 450 square mile uh, sanctuary. As you can see, Alpena, Michigan uh, is located right here. Um, we'll talk about that city in a little bit, but it's a unique sanctuary. One is the first sanctuary designated to protect a collection of shipwrecks. It's the first sanctuary to be designated completely within state waters. The Great Lakes all, the bottom lands of the Great Lakes belong to the states in which they're off of. So in Michigan, it's, uh, Lake Huron is divided, half of it is Canada, half of it is overseed by the state. So we partner with the state of Michigan. We're also unique, obviously, as we're the only freshwater sanctuary. So I'd say you're the only sanctuary you can drink. Um, and uh, here you can see there's not many sanctuaries that you can walk across part of the year. So this is my daughter going for a stroll over the sanctuary. We had a, a, a freeze uh, last winter that was very quick. Uh, the lake froze crystal clear, and we could actually go. We looked for shipwreck parts by walking through the ice and actually got some drones up to look, th look through the ice. So um, we're not anxious for the ice yet, where we need a little more time for that. Um, the sanctuary was, was, was designated in 2000. Um, there was some opposition to the sanctuary when we were first designated. Uh, there was fear that we would regulate fishing, that we may cut off access to diving, that we may charge for diving, some general distrust in the federal government. And in 1997, there was a referendum held in the city uh, asking the residents if they wanted the sanctuary there. 70% of the community said they did not want the sanctuary there. Several local governments passed resolutions against it. And over the next two and a half years, the state and NOAA worked together to finally come to agreement and a compromise that allowed it to happen. But it said if after five years of the sanctuary being designated, we would do uh, a review and to see where we were with the designation. At that five-year period, uh, every single county, local government, city, township passed a resolution in support of the sanctuary and actually promoted its expansion and ex a significant expansion as well. Today, the sanctuary is 4,300 square miles, um, one of the largest, uh, it's larger than all of the uh, national parks in Michigan combined, times five. Uh, so it's a major piece of, of Lake Huron, and it protects, again, those 200 uh, shipwrecks. And so what I want to talk about is, again, what Howard kept saying is connections. How did we make connections with people to turn overwhelming opposition into uh, a really a movement for preservation and conservation in, in northern Michigan. So a little bit about the community. Uh, it is a, it's a great place. It's very remote. Uh, as you can see, if you want to, where we're located, we're on the 45th parallel, so halfway between the North Pole and the equator. Uh, when I got on the plane last night, it felt like we were a hell of a lot closer to the North Pole than the equator. Um, <laughs> but in the summer, it is beautiful. It is an incredible place. And as you can see, we're located up on uh, northern uh, Lake Huron. But it's, it's always had a rich industry. Uh, first with lumbering, logging, um, mineral extraction, limestone, uh, and from its very beginning, it had an industrial base, and that's what it was based on. Resource extraction, later manufacturing, and still today, there's still lumbering industries and, and mining. So the work that we're doing there, really, the resources we're protecting is a resources that is authentic to that area. It's connected um, to the history of that area. 
In the 90s, the area had a very, very tough economic time. Um, as you may remember from the news, Michigan had a real tough time in the 90s and early 2000s. We had double-digit um, unemployment for a couple decades in a row. Um, very tough place at low income and extremely remote. Um, we're about four hours north of Detroit, a town of about 10,000. But to get to another town larger than that, you have to travel about three hours. So it's an extremely remote area, but connected to this lake and looked for ways to, to make it better. And before I go on, we need to make a stop because I, um, just as some people uh, from the interior of this, the country aren't that familiar with uh, the, our coast, sometimes people on the exterior are not that familiar with the Great Lakes. So I want to put a couple things in perspective for you for the Great Lakes. So 70% of the planet is covered by water. We're the blue, the blue marble here as you see it. We know about that. And so if we were to take this room and you were all the water of the earth, this front row here would be all of the fresh water on the planet. Most of that water is locked up either in groundwater or in ice caps. So David, could you stand up, please? So almost all of the fresh water is, is uh, locked up in the ice caps and water. Only 0.01% of the fresh water on Earth is surface fresh water in rivers and lakes. So if this whole room is all the water, Dave's finger, give me one finger, pick, be careful with the finger you pick up. <laughs> um, that represents all of the surface fresh water on Earth. So take a seat, Dave. So when we think of water, we, we think water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. And this, this demonstrates it. But 20% of Dave's pinky is in the Great Lakes. 20%, 21% of the Earth's fresh water is located in there. It's incredible natural resource. And we think of the scarcity of fresh water and the importance of fresh water. Sometimes that makes people think, well, then the lakes can't be that big. But they are, for those that haven't been there, there are about 94,000 square miles of, of water, um, over 10,000 miles of shoreline in, in the Great Lakes system. Michigan alone has, is the second only behind Alaska with the most shoreline in the state. So it tells you how large these, these bodies of water are. They penetrate the continent about 1,000 miles, about 1,500 miles, six, almost 2,000 miles if you can count the St. Lawrence Seaway. So it's besides the natural resource, it's an incredible transportation highway. And again, it's such a critical natural resource, not just for us, but for, but for, for the world. They also get a little angry every once in a while, so we'll talk about that. So we like to <laughs> promote our lovely areas. So it's, uh, this is the people have really be, have Great Lakes pride. Uh, we come visit us. It's great. You can drink it. You won't get bit by sharks. So, but that makes you think it's safe. Um, but they, the storms there are very notorious. But uh, for the next couple minutes, I'll give you, we're going to rush through about 12,000 years of history in about six minutes. So we need to go fast. But for as long as people have lived on the lakes, and the lakes formed through glaciers, so they've been there about tw a little over 12,000 years, people have exploited the lakes for transportation, for natural, resource, natural resources, uh, communications as well. And it's, it's moved with time. Um, but there's a few things that really change, change that. In 1679, the Griffin was built. Uh, one of the, before that, all of the trade that had taken place on the Great Lakes were in birch bark canoes. So the first ship uh, was the Griffin, 1679, built above the Niagara Falls, right? Because you can't sail through the St. Lawrence or sail over, uh, over the falls. Built there and was built for the fur trade industry. And they, they was loaded up with supplies headed to Lake Michigan, uh, to a fur trade post, dropped off the supplies, loaded up furs, and headed back, and was never seen again. So the first ship on the Great Lakes became the first shipwreck on its first voyage. So uh, uh, it is the holy grail of Great Lakes shipwrecks. Probably only the Edmund Fitzgerald is more famous than this one, uh, but it has not been found, and uh, people are very anxious to find it one, one day. Um, we talk, Howard talked about it, how we're connected by water. And I, on my flight here last night, I sat next to a woman and, and we were looking out, beautiful sunset last night and ships everywhere as you're, as you're landing. And this lady just couldn't fathom why all these ships were here. And I think the mission he, he talks about, people have lost connection to the importance of maritime. Forget about history, but the maritime 
uh, connections today. And we've always been and always will be connected by water but separated by land. It has always been much easier. But in 1820, uh, there was a study by U.S. Congress done comparing water versus land travel. And you could move a cargo of, of freight across the Atlantic from New York to London for the same price as you could move a cargo on the nation's best turnpikes, one, 30 miles. Water has always been the easiest way to transport things and it will will continue to do that roads were tough difficult there was an early study of these early roads and uh, talked about the specs that they had to be and one of the requirements is that stumps couldn't be more than a foot high so that that tells you tells you how it was so but I mentioned the lakes being connected to the Atlantic through the St. Lawrence but there were rapids there so we couldn't couldn't sail up and so what 1825 before 1825, very little going on in the lakes besides the fur trade. Some, some ships built, but the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825 changed absolutely everything. Uh, this is DeWitt Clinton, uh, the governor of New York, pouring a cask of water from Lake Erie uh, into the Atlantic in New York, celebrating the opening of the Erie Canal. The DNR would arrest you on spot right now for doing, <laughs> for doing this. But, uh, and that is a joke, but this connections that were made through the Erie Canal, later the St. Lawrence, the other canals as well, would have other long-term ecological impacts on this. But this, this changed everything, and immediately uh, the area started to explode. Um, the population of the region from 1832 to 1840 quadrupled. It went from little frontier outposts to giant cities. Chicago did not appear in the census in 1825. It had over 100,000 people by 1870. Milwaukee, Detroit, were 45,000 people. They were nothing before this, and it was just an explosion. And as people came in through the Erie Canal, um, resources moved back and forth, and it just exploded. And with that came more and more ships. Cities developed, towns developed. This is a small town in Wisconsin, and there were just so many of these towns feeding lumber, feeding grain, and build, building the entire region. And that continued and continued. Ships got bigger and bigger and continues to be a major force for us today. And I think the reason the woman that sat next to me on the plane last night did not have any connection to this or couldn't understand why those ships were there is because so few people are involved in that industry. There's still as much traffic going on, but this freighter represents thousands of those schooners that used to operate it. So before, everybody had a connection to the water, and, and we don't anymore. So in from 1825 to now, um, it's been, there's all of this traffic moving across the lakes. And the term lake is often misleading when we think of the size and scale. These 94,000 square miles, seas have been measured up to 40 feet high, regular 30 foot seas. And as you look in some of these images of waves, I'll show you, a difference between the ocean and Great Lakes is the frequency of the waves in the Great Lakes, because it's all wind generated. The waves are literally right on top of one another, and they pound the ships. This is one of the shipwrecks in the sanctuary that sank in 1913, the Isaac M. Scott, a 500-foot freighter uh, that was lost, and that was one of those times where they had about 35-foot seas uh, that capsized this, this vessel. So probably about five to 6,000 shipwrecks have wrecked in the Great Lakes, an amazing number, and what makes them special is that they are from a pretty tight time period when we think about that 1825 to modern day time. But the cold, fresh water preserved these like no, no other place in the world. They're some of the best preserved shipwrecks anywhere. It's fresh water, so there's no, the salts are not corroding the iron uh, and no marine organisms. That, that fresh water, there's not the marine organisms that devour the wood and other organic materials. So many of these ships are literally what they look like the day they went, went on them. Many of our, our ships still have the paint on them as they're sitting upright with the mass still standing. So why, if there's all of these shipwrecks across the Great Lakes, why Thunder Bay? And the collection that we have there is, is special for a couple reasons, but the reason so many wrecked up in this corner, three things converge in, in this area. One, up, up top you can see the shipping lanes where they come together, uh, the upbound and downbound traffic coming together. There's also two weather patterns that collide right in this area up here that causes extremely unstable water, weather. You can have a clear, clear, clear skies one day and then fog comes in like that. You can have flat, sea, flat seas and all of a sudden the waves come. So there's quite a bit of collisions that happen in there because of the sea state and the fog. And the third thing that collides there is land meets water where we have this 
giant peninsula that sticks out, and all of these islands have submerged limestone reefs that come out there that cause a shipwreck, shipwreck trap. This whole corridor there is known as Shipwreck Alley because of the incredible number of shipwrecks. Um, when we think about underwater archaeology, we think of these ships going down and they're a moment frozen in time. When that ship thinks everything goes down with it and it sits there preserved. We're in a terrestrial site. If, a, if we go to an archaeological site, people continue to walk over it, they pick over it. This, this sits undisturbed for hundreds of years. And with the preservation, they're unbelievable. And so besides the shipwrecks, we have Native American sites, inundated uh, terrestrial sites that are preserved by this cold fresh water. But is really, this, this collection is a museum under the sea for us. And the, what we are, I always, I use the word fortunate, but I, I don't like saying that with shipwreck. It seems awkward to say we're fortunate to have these shipwrecks. But the collection that we have really represents that 150-year history from early, very early vessels to modern vessels. And then we have uh, them, they've sank in a variety of depths. So we have sites, as you can see here, from very shallow to very deep. And so different people can access them. And these are incredible resources for archaeologists and historians, but they're also incredible economic engines for our tourism industry. Diving, kayaking, snorkeling, paddleboarding, glass bottom boat, people coming to explore these shipwrecks. And what make them very interesting for archaeologists and the recreational folks also make them intriguing for people with other intentions. These sites are also targeted for the artifacts, for artifact collectors and looting. And so our work is to protect these sites for future generations. But we want to do so in a way where we can give access to them so people can experience them and explore them, but then still, still leave them as they are and enjoy them for future generations. And the way that we make those connections is we really try to connect people to the sites. We look for ways to, 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 to make these connections. And when it's something is 100 feet underwater, it's very difficult to make the connection. We're at a national park. If you go to the Grand Canyon, it's very easy to see how that's special. When you look over Lake Huron, it is beautiful, but it is hard to make the connections to these wrecks. So we're, we look for ways to connect non-divers to these sites. And we look to how do we get kids and, and, and other non-traditional users of these sites to connect with these sites. And we've, we've come up with a variety of ways uh, that we do that. And we've partnered with our community to look at this sanctuary as a way, how can it improve the quality of life in our community? We want to protect these sites, but not just, site, not just for protection for protection's sake, but how do we use it as an economic driver? How do we use it to increase our quality of life? And here's a quote from our Chamber of Commerce when we move through that expansion process. The way that we do that is through research and monitoring, education programs, community engagement, all coming together, really trying to make sure these resources are protected for future generations. Research is key to what we do. I mentioned we have about 200 shipwrecks there. About 100 of those wrecks have been found. So there's still 100 more left for us to discover. And so we do that through archival research and then going out in the water and diving and looking at some of these sites. But a real key way that we do that is through mapping. We use different types of sonar technology to map the bottom of the lake. We're doing this for multiple reasons. One of the reasons is obviously to find a shipwreck, um, but we're also doing it where it's giving us information about fish habitat so we can share those with biologists to keep the ecosystem safe. We share the data with the charting folks at NOAA, so it also helps with navigation. And so all of this work is not only to helping us the history of the area, but helping us better understand the lake itself. The sanctuary works hard to bring technology in, again, for the same reason. Uh, we have data buoys out where we're seeing how climate's impacting the lake, how it's impacting the fisheries. Uh, we're monitoring um, the shipwrecks over time with different technologies. And I mentioned the changing ecosystem uh, that we have in the Great Lakes. And where the opening up of the Great Lakes to the, to the ocean was an incredible thing for commerce, but it came at a cost. There are over almost 200 invasive species that are within the lakes. And if you think of the Great Lakes, they were isolated for thousands and thousands of years. So it, 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 was, uh, it wasn't as robust as other areas where they'd faced invasives before that. So it was a pretty protected. But once the St. Lawrence Seaway opened up, it introduced an amazing number of uh, invasive species at once. The zebra and coaga mussel is one that people have probably heard about. They've trillions and trillions of, of these mussels have invaded the lakes. 
uh, the zebra mussel was the first one to come in, but it had a, tolerant, a certain tolerance for depth and cold, so we were only seeing them at about, to about 100 feet of water. This shipwreck here is in about 180 feet of water, and you can see in the early 2000s there wasn't any mussels on it at all. The Kawaga mussel came in, which is a mussel that has a higher tolerance for cold, and just a few years later the entire wreck is covered with, with, these, with these vessels, with, with these mussels. You can read the name here. If, when you're an archaeologist and you find a shipwreck and the name's on, written on the side of it, pretty easy to identify it. So the Kyle Spangler, you can read that right here. And you can see here, you can barely make it out here. But one of the impacts of the zebra mussels, besides attaching to the wrecks, is anytime divers come, they want a picture of the name. So they're wiping off the zebra mussels, which is taking off the paint and slowly, slowly uh, degrading it. Um, the water levels have been changing more rapidly than ever. We've gone from extreme highs to extreme lows in just a few years. Um, and this beast, uh, the Asian carp, is waiting at the doorsteps of the Great Lakes. It's in the Mississippi River, potentially uh, could come in through the sh Chicago uh, uh, shipping channel. And so one of the things we do is we work to try to work with biologists and other resource managers, since we're going to these sites, looking and monitoring for invasive species, as well as what's happening to the, to the environment. Um, this here is a project we did where we did some restorations, trying to restore some of the native uh, fish populations. We have been extremely fortunate that we've had some major researchers come to our little remote area and really tell the story of this incredible place. Um, this is Jean-Michel Cousteau, the son of Jacques Cousteau. Um, this is Dr. Ballard, who found the Titanic, Bismarck, PT-109. I think he goes after every ship with a song written after it. Um, uh, he's, he's come to Alpena about five different times. Um, National Geographic, BBC, History Channel, many of the folks uh, from the Monitor team has been part of, part of these projects. And so with these projects, these, each of these projects brings funding with it, and they conduct actual research for us so we better understand our resources. But the important part other than that is these documentaries air and promote our area. They tell people about it and helps, helps with our economics. And lastly, these videos we use in the classroom so they become an education piece. So we get research done, we promote our area, and we have um, education components with it. One of the um, projects like this I'd like to highlight is one that's called Project Ship Hunt. And Sony and Intel were launching a new laptop a few years ago. And they wanted to see if you could find a shipwreck just with using a Sony laptop. The answer is you need a boat and a research crew and some real <laughs> equipment to go with it, but we listened to them, and I've got to say, I, the monitor crew passed them on to us. They looked all over the world where they could do this program. They wanted to bring students up and give them a real experience, do a documentary, and that would launch this project, and it would be part of their promotion. And so when I, we were on the phone with them talking about this project, and they said, well, we need to guarantee that we're going to find a shipwreck. And I said, well, we can't guarantee we find a shipwreck. We, we look sometimes years and we don't find one, but you know, there's a hundred of them, we got a good chance, and we're going back and forth. And they said, well, we, we'll find this much. Okay, yeah, I think we'll find a shipwreck. And so they had about, a, there were a couple commas in the uh, number that they had for this project. And so uh, they brought up, um, the students you see here are five students from Saginaw, Michigan. They, they brought them up and spent a couple weeks with us looking, looking for a shipwreck. Um, and it was a specific shipwreck that they wanted to find, the Choctaw, um, which was a unique bulk carrier uh, type vessel, steel vessel that was built. Um, and it was part of a line of vessels called whalebacks, which were vessels that had a pretty short lifespan in the Great Lakes. But remember when I talked about the wave frequency and just how the, the ships would get pounded? They had these rounded edges that would allow the waves literally just to roll over it so they could handle a much heavier seas. But, what did you notice about these, which you, know, which you didn't notice any of the other ships, they're not boxy. And in the lakes, most everything they're carrying is bulk carrier, so every square inch matters. And so while these had an interesting life, they proved not efficient because it was harder to load, and they just couldn't carry quite as much, but very unique. And the Choctaw was one that had not been found, and that's the one that Sony wanted to go after. On a foggy night, the MF Merrick was bound on a southerly course towards Portage.
suddenly, from out of the fog, emerged the RP Raymond. The Merrick went down quickly, and the sea swallowed the ship, seemingly forever. When people think of Michigan, they think of the automotive industry. With the demise of it comes a heavy blow. Several years ago, we had a lot of people leave the Saginaw area because there was a, a lack of job opportunity. And so that caused us to lose a lot of our students. When we have fewer students, there's fewer dollars. We have a very fixed budget, maybe $200 a year that we can order different things. I think that there are bigger and better places where there's more opportunity, but this will always be home. I don't like school. Like, for me, I want a little challenge in life. Something will make you think. Students these days want to be engaged. They want to learn by doing something. Our way of thinking about how we educate kids and what we hope for them needs to be just as imaginative as the technology that is driving everything. I'm a... Uh... Dr. James Delgado. I was the chief scientist on the mission to map the Titanic. Out here at Thunder Bay, there's a lot of shipwrecks, but not all of them have been found. And so what we're gonna do is go find one. And yes, there will be adventure. We was gonna do something out of the box, something different, something that people from SAG and all don't normally do. I'm a small town guy. I've never done something on this big of a scale. What now is encompassed in a Sony Vio laptop was once inaccessible to us on ships. And now, with the ability to take millions of data points that we collect from sonar, run them through an Intel processor, and come out with these maps that really enable us to peer down hundreds of feet to find something at the bottom of the sea. Because it's so deep out here, we use the multi-beam sonar itself. We're actually going back and forth, painting the actual seafloor with sound. We were looking at the multi-beam for things that looked man-made or unnatural. What is that? There's two masks coming up. Is this shit? Oh my gosh. All right, guys. Look at that. That is a shit. Oh my goodness. It was clear. We got everything from the side scan right then and there. It looked just like a pirate ship. It was suspense. It was like, oh, let's get there, let's get there, let's go. We were expected to do everything. We had to pick out what we were gonna look for first with the ROV. We had to tell the divers what to look for. The first priority, search for a name. We can start descent. You got something right in front of you. Oh, oh my God. Oh. That's it. There she is. <laughs> it's high school team. You don't get a chance to, to see all the different things that are actually out there outside of Saginaw. And this kind of opened my eyes. I feel more confident now. And it's just like something you do that really makes you change. When I got to like, go out there and experience all this different technology, it made me realize, you know, there's so much that the world has to offer. This experience changed my entire outlook. It's something that affected me more than anything. I had dreams, but I never thought that I'd be able to accomplish them. But now I really see that I can achieve my dreams. Education at its best engages and inspires, and what they're doing is leaving behind a legacy 
a legacy of a ship found, of stories resolved, of a place that people can visit and connect to. In many ways, this isn't just a ship hunt. This is a lesson about life. So in the video, we didn't mention the word Choctaw. Did you notice that? Because we didn't find the Choctaw. We found two shipwrecks, but one of them was not the Choctaw. So uh, that is actually a full documentary, and uh, it's available online. And maybe I can get the link to that to them, and we can email it out to you if you're interested in seeing it. But it is an incredible story, and, and you hear about these kids. And we'll come back uh, to the kids in a minute. Um, so great. Great way to get these kids out there. We got incredible work done. And when you see this full film, a great education piece. But we did not find the Choctaw. And so I, this usually isn't in my talk, so I inserted this here. Uh, we just did a grant called Pushing the Boundaries Using Advanced Technology to Locate and Rapidly Assess Cultural Sites in Multiple Underwater Environments Within NOAA's Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. I'm not sure if pushing the boundaries refers to a 25-word title of a grant or if it's actually the grant. Uh, but this was our project we did, and this was a unique one where we looked in extremes. Um, so I, a couple times I've mentioned the shallow water wrecks that we have, which are, are incredible sites because we can get people out to them pretty easily. And what's happened is the ships got run aground. The, over time, the uh, ice and the, and the waves kept pounding them apart and got them in very shallow waters. But this is exceptionally difficult for us to find ships in that site. So part of this grant was looking in shallow water for, for sites. And how can we do that? We can't tow our, our $100,000 piece of equipment in that shallow water. So we use drones uh, to try to go out and, and um, explore the shallow areas looking for wreckage. And in warmer climates, a way that you do this is you do something that's called tow boarding, where you hang on and a boat pulls you behind and the, the archaeologist is snorkeling, looks for a site, and if they find something, they let go and mark the site. But in 40 degree water, it's not that fun doing this one. So uh, we, we tried uh, the, the drones. And as you can see, the, the water is crystal clear. And this is one of my favorite sites. This is about a three foot mooring buoy with about a 15 foot tagline that the boats come off, just to give you some, some scale in there. So uh, you, we are literally, if we get the right conditions, we're peering down into the water and finding, finding some of the sites. And so we targeted some of the areas where we knew shipwrecks had happened. Not all, not all of the wrecks ended up as a permanent wreck. They got off, but they'd leave material behind. So we'd look at those reefs that I mentioned, and literally we've identified hundreds of pieces of shipwrecks, parts and pieces, that we'll monitor over time uh, through this. The second part of the Pushing the Boundaries grant was looking in deep water and using that same type of technology um, that we saw in Ship Hunt where we're mapping, using multi-beam, both pole-mounted or side-scan sonar on an AUV, which is a, uh, basically a torpedo-like device that we program, and it goes off by itself mapping. And I, we did find, again, this usually doesn't happen, but we found two different targets on this project. And one of them was about a 300-foot long ship. Here you can see the, the image of it, the sonar image of it here. Great one. And then a second one here that is uh, kind of buried in the, the mud, turned over on its side. You can, you can see uh, the rudder there. And so the f we found those. We had planned with Joe and the team here to go diving these sites as soon as we found them. But they were just a little bit outside of our depth range to put divers in there. And so we had to switch gears. And we partnered with some universities to get some remotely operated vehicles on these sites, and we found, we looked at the different diagnostics that we found, looked for things. We didn't see any names this time, so we had to work a little harder. Uh, but we looked and compared sites, and we were able to identify the first target as a, the 202-foot Ohio. Uh, very cool site, beautifully preserved. But then the second one that we looked at, in fact, was the Choctaw. So we did finally complete that mission and find the Choctaw here, and she's in beautiful shape. Um, we, we found that at the end of last season, so we're making our plans for next year how we can further document these sites. We'll list them on the National Register of Historic Places. We'll do some 3D modeling so we can make them accessible and eventually open them up to technical diving. But as soon as we found them, we knew there were five people we had to call. 
And so uh, we've, we tracked down the kids, and some of them we still had better connections with, and, and we did, did connect with them, and they were all very excited. And when we said, we got something to tell you, they said, you found the Choctaw. And uh, this young woman here, we've stayed in contact with, she's now graduated from Western Michigan with a degree in film, and uh, she'll be coming up to Alpena this January where we have a film festival and teaching a workshop for students uh, on film. And we really have, through these projects, found how powerful film is to connecting people. Again, that word that Howard uses, how we can make these connections uh, to these sites. And uh, we are really working hard to do more with films to bring them in to connect folks, but also have students make their own films. And that's, that's what she'll be helping us with. And that will be part of a film festival uh, that we have coming up here. And I'm going to give you a quick preview of this. And this is one that I'll talk over a little bit here. But um, each year, we bring uh, films from around the country here uh, to, to, to Alpena, not just about the Great Lakes, but about the ocean. And I think Howard nailed it when he talked about it. It's not just our local connection to these places. It's how the, all of these bodies of water are connected. And the issues that we face in the Great Lakes ultimately are going to affect the ocean, uh, not just on the Atlantic, but around the world. And I'll just let you look at some of these images from the film festival. Films from around the world that will come and expose, again, another tourism thing where we try to bring people to our community, but also share with people in our community uh, stuff about the ocean and why it's important to protect. Two of the films uh, feature the sanctuary. One, you saw some individuals paddle boarding. Uh, this summer we had three individuals paddle all the way across Lake Huron, 90 miles in a day, uh, to raise money for the sanctuary. Um, they came in after they were done and literally were shaking and could hardly stand as we had a celebration for them. The other one, a group of women uh, dove all five Great Lakes in a 24-hour period. And they didn't just dive all five Great Lakes, they dove a shipwreck in each of the Great Lakes to raise awareness to women in diving and the importance of protecting the Great Lakes. Um, I wish we could do a ship hunt for every single kid in Northeast Michigan, but uh, Sony wouldn't fund that for us. So. Um, <laughs> But it really shows the, how we can make connections uh, to, 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 to people and use, use the resources to connect people. Uh, earlier today, we were talking about the history of the sanctuary. And when we first started, we didn't have a visitor center and we didn't have glass bottom boats. There wasn't anything. We would bring in a tall ship, the Dennis Sullivan from Milwaukee would come over and we'd do some programs for students out on Lake Huron. And we could get about two groups of 40 out a day um, we could do that for about four days, once a year, and it was so pretty limited number of kids we connected out on the wire. But when we did survey work of those kids, we noticed, or we found out that about 70 to 80 percent of the kids had never been on Lake Huron before that had grown up on the shores of there. And it really opened our eyes that if we want people to care about this resource, we have to find ways to get them out in and on, next to, under the water. And that kind of became a philosophy of our education programs. And so, we work with local school districts to not just be a field trip where people come in and drop them off in our museum for four hours so, that, so the teacher gets a break. How can we do programs where it's stewardship type programs? So we have students where kids are monitoring the watershed. We have students where they're going on the glass bottom boat doing archaeological investigations. And one that we're really proud of is a class called Shipwreck Alley. And I'm going to show you a quick video on that now run through your list of archaeology observations one more time. Make sure that you have as much information on each wreck as possible. My name is John Capeless. We're at Alpena High School. 
Shipwreck Alley is a class that was designed to cover all aspects of marine sanctuary operations. So what makes Shipwreck Alley exciting is that I can create some pretty powerful learning opportunities for the students. The class is really built around earth science. This is an earth science classroom. Shipwrecks run aground so we can talk about some of the unique geology. And then we move on to meteorology. Storms, fog, wind, waves, they all cause shipwrecks. Imagine yourself out on the Great Lakes in November. Talk about resources, natural resources in the region. Then we do some archaeology, which really opens up opportunities to work with the sanctuary. And in the end, we tie it all back into lake ecology and how the lakes are changing and how we keep the ecosystem thriving. We're looking for propulsion type, right? So if we want to identify the ship, we have to figure out if there's any machinery that indicates it's a sailing vessel or a steamer. I couldn't wait to connect the sanctuary with my students because I knew they could create opportunities for my students that I couldn't do alone. Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary is like a museum under the sea. Everything that we do that's really cool in this class has marine sanctuary hands on it. They feed us a lot of the, the real world information that brings that learning alive and they create the field work opportunities or, or they help me find field work opportunities. Check out one more wreck. I think we have time for one more. Yeah. Yeah. This particular class, Shipwreck Alley, doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. We started with a pilot program of 30, one class, 30 students. The next year we went to three classes, about 90 students, and then we went over 200 students the third year of the program. The idea that we're exposing two-thirds of every kid who graduates from Alpena High School to Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary and its mission and the positive effect it has on the community, I think that's a powerful thing. I love the fact that I get to partner with the sanctuary. Every person on that staff is positive and has a can-do attitude. Things get done around there, and it's, it's been an amazing thing for our community. So when Howard in, introduced me, he said that before I came here, I was the state underwater archaeologist for the state of Wisconsin. Um, there are, when I was in that position, there were seven states that had that position. So one thing we don't want to do is train thousands of underwater archaeologists, because there really aren't that many jobs, right? So what we're using this type of research is to get students involved in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and history, and making history come alive, and blending all of those things at the same time. And one of the programs we do with that that is similar to Shipwreck Alley, where it's a, a program, it's not just a one-off experience, is using underwater robotics and having kids design and build underwater robots. Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary helps regional schools participate in the MATE ROV competition. The MATE, or Marine Advanced Technology Education Program, offers students from diverse backgrounds the opportunity to work in a fast-paced, collaborative, and challenging environment. This past May, regional competition was held at Alpena High School near the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, preparing them for real-world jobs that require the use of science, technology, engineering, and math. Jobs that are in high demand and growing every year. It might look like fun and games, but these kids are getting a leg up on the competition for complex jobs in marine industries. From science and exploration to energy, national security, research, and search and recovery. Students from K through 12 and community colleges and universities can participate in MATE. And the competition is global. In 2014, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary hosted the international competition and students from teams across the globe gathered in Alpena, Michigan, using the sanctuary's dive training tank to compete. Participating in MATE is just one way the National Marine Sanctuaries are helping students and communities prepare for exciting careers in marine industries. Okay, you are now into your mission time. At the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, getting young people in the community started in high-tech marine fields is just the beginning. Partnerships with the local community college have allowed students at the collegiate level to develop skills in a unique program of study. It trains them on high-end ROV equipment and simulators like the one designed by Oceaneering, which allows students to understand how to control complex ROVs for use in the energy industry and beyond. Connecting communities to real-world experiences that help launch and advance careers. Just one part of what we are doing at the National Marine Sanctuary. 
part of Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary's mission is outreach and education. And this is one of the most important education programs that they run each year. I teach at Alpena Community College. I do our ROV uh, technology program. It has taught us a lot of real life skills. I know a few people on my team are using the skills they learn to go on and be engineers or ROV pilots. We are both employed by Oceaneering International as ROV technicians and we started through the Marine Sanctuary and Alpena Communities College Marine Technology Program. You can learn more about the MATE ROV competition by visiting www.marinetech.org and learn more about our educational programs and partnerships at sanctuaries.noaa.gov. So we're excited about those programs and one of the ways that we connect with students is we have a visitor center here uh, in, at our, at our, in Alpena there that we get about 100,000 visitors a year that we attract to this, this tiny town and that's had huge economic impact on the, the community. And where it is located, uh, it's located on the Thunder Bay River in that paper plant that I talked about in the very beginning that closed in 2000 where the people lost, lost their jobs. The, a developer purchased the paper mill out of bankruptcy, hired many of the workers back to do the restoration and, and help what was always an industrial property become uh, a major revitalization of, of the downtown of, of the area and we were the anchor tenant, the first one in, in this redevelopment. But the center is great and we love it, but what we need to remember, it is a visitor center and our exhibits are, we'll show you a little bit about those in a second with the final video, but, um, but we really use the center to remind people about what's out in Lake Huron and how they can get out and ex explore that. And we have an active program where we work with different recreational providers to get them out fishing, diving, kayaking, snorkeling, and getting out to our state parks and ex exploring this beautiful part of, of our country. The city has really adopted the sanctuary and has started to use it in its brand. The, the brand of the community now is Alpena Sanctuary of the Great Lakes, and that means much more than just the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. That means the incredible lifestyle, that what it likes to live in a northern northern climate and we have marketing that goes along with this that really tries to promote this and talks about the brand of what the community is and what we really want to become and when in the beginning of this we and I say we it was the Chamber of Commerce the city all of these groups kind of pieced together to come up with this brand and then a marketing campaign we worked together and we didn't have very much money so we did a lot of the photo shoots ourselves and kind of crane up with a creative material and some of these shots were actually done by us Here's one of the photo shoots that we did on the beach, a yoga scene, and see if you can guess which one's me. <laughs> this is more embarrassing when you know that my wife owns two health clubs in town. So um, I think I was just ahead of everybody. I was one step ahead of everybody. So uh, final video here that talks about the recreational experiences that you can have at the sanctuary. The lakes don't give up their secrets easily. The water's cold. Oftentimes you can't see too much because it's still dark. It's 200 feet plus down there. And then all of a sudden the visibility opens and there's an intact schooner underneath you. She's over 150 years old. She's sailing along the bottom through the sands, still proud, still beautiful. This is one of the best shipwreck sites in the world. Shipwreck Alley is an area of northern Lake Huron where lots and lots of vessels converged over the course of about a century. And it's because of a high density of vessels. All of the ships going from one lake to another really had to pass by Thunder Bay. Many of them ran into each other. Others hit rocks. Others foundered in storms. You know, one of the great things about the shipwrecks in Thunder Bay is you don't have to be a professional diver to visit them. Uh, there are shipwrecks at all different depths whether you're a, a technical diver and dive to 300 feet, or whether you're just snorkeling. The sanctuary really encourages people to get out and explore Lake Huron itself. Uh, kayaking, the water is so clear in some spots that you can just kayak over these wrecks and see them. One of the ways that you can get out and explore the sanctuary is through the glass bottom boat, the Lady Michigan. Welcome aboard the Lady Michigan. Hello, and welcome to the Underwater Museum. See you, right? You ready for a boat ride? It's 
65 foot passenger vessel that takes people out and explores Thunder Bay, but has a window to the bottom of the lake where you can actually see these shipwrecks. We've got a custom built glass bottom boat that can take anyone to these magical sites. You don't even have to get your feet wet to visit a shipwreck site. And just north of the sanctuary is 40 mile point where you'll find along the beach the wreckage of the Joseph Bay, an over 200 foot long steamer that ran ashore at the turn of the 20th century. So of course you can go out into the lake and experience the shipwrecks. You can see the artifacts and the whole structure still there. Or, like in this room we're in now, you can see the artifacts here in dry land that we're able to share with you. Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary's Visitor Center is not your typical museum. It's very experiential. We love it when families come in because we do have some artifacts and historical items in cases, but most of the exhibit is really hands-on. You can sit in a lifeboat. You can take the wheel of a schooner. When you're on the Western Hope, which is a replica of a real-life canal schooner, the lightning is flashing, the waves are splashing. The wind is at your back, you're at the wheel. It's, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna make it into Thunder Bay? What was it like 100 years ago to be sailing on a giant schooner on the Great Lakes? You know, at the visitor center, there's, there's something for everyone. Uh, so a family can come here and spend a couple hours. Uh, for kids, there's, there's tubes and slides and history specifically tailored for young people. But really, it's a place that introduces you to the idea of historic preservation, to history, to archaeology. One of our goals at the visitor center is really to encourage people to get out and explore the sanctuary. The sanctuary is a 450 square mile underwater park that protects the Great Lakes and its rich history. The Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary is a world-class collection of shipwrecks. This is a place to explore, to engage in history. This is Shipwreck Alley. Did you notice how there was no snow in, that, in those pictures for that, for our marketing one, right? So uh, Howard mentioned connections, we'll say that again. And in order to help foster some of those connections, any Mariners uh, Museum uh, members can have free admission into, into our museum if you come visit. We hope you come visit us, and we'd be excited uh, for you to, to, to do that. So, um, and as if you look at this billboard here, our exhibits are free. Um, okay. So Joe grenade seeing if anybody was still awake. Yeah, so. Um, so no, but uh, in closing, uh, really what we're doing, and as you've noticed, there's a strong focus on, on youth and how we can get that when, when this country decided they didn't want people to smoke anymore, who did they target? They targeted youth, and that's, we, we are doing that as well, trying to get them to have connections to the lake and really seeing how history is still important today and why we're working uh, to preserve it. And uh, when we, the vision of our program, we, we started out with the mission, our vision is, is this, it's thriving sanctuaries, these 14, hopefully soon 16 places, small, when we look at that giant earth, small, but the things that we do there will really inspire other people to take actions in areas that are not protected areas, so uh, future generations can enjoy our incredible oceans and great lakes. So thank you, and uh, if we have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, great question. So when you have a 4,300 square mile area, it's very hard to patrol. And we work with our Department of Natural Resources, uh, Coast Guard, and County uh, Marine Patrol that, that do patrols for us for our law enforcement side. That said, it is almost, it's very difficult to connect 
catch someone that wants to loot it. And most of our cases that we, we get is other divers are reporting it. Uh, the dive charters that are visiting these sites, this is their economic livelihood. And so as, as artifacts are disappearing, that's taking that into threat. And so it's been driven underground. And so education is really the, our biggest uh, way to do that. But we do have law enforcement that, that can deal with that, but that won't do it alone. We, we, need, we need to work with people and educate them how they're doing. And it's, it's really changed quite a bit. In, in the 60s and 70s, when a wreck was found, there's incredible pictures of the docks of Alpena Every, you know, just a whole dock loaded with artifacts, giant anchors pulled up, guys without shirts kneeling next to it, you know, and taking a trophy. But the whole ethics have changed because I think people realize, um, and many of the artifacts that we have in our museum are not recovered by us. They're artifacts that somebody took before that had been sitting in their basement that they now realize was, was, should be in a public, public place. So. Um, it's, if you Google Project Ship Hunt, it'll come up and it's on Vimeo. Uh, there's also a YouTube version of it on our website, which I don't have off, but maybe there's an email you guys could blast, blast off. And if, if anybody doesn't have a, a way to do that, I could get you a hard copy of it as well. So one thing that I neglected to mention at the beginning of this evening is that we have started, as, as I'm sure you've noticed, uh, recording these lectures and they will be up on our website on marinersmuseum.org uh, very soon. So if you go to marinersmuseum.org slash videos, you can see some of our past lectures from the spring and there are new ones going up all the time. We'll put Jeff's lecture up there and we'll put a link to the other uh, Okay, video yeah. Again. It's a great film. It is worth, worth watching. How were the students selected to participate um. The question was, how were the students selected? Um, Sony and Intel picked the students. Um, initially, they, were, they weren't even uh, scheduled or planned to be from Michigan. I think they were looking from California. We pushed hard. We wanted them from our community. Uh, they went to Saginaw. They wanted a little more diversity in, in the group. And so uh, through a nomination process at that school district. Yeah, so it was uh, some incredible, incredible kids. So. Nope, yep, so the, the, the sanctuary is open for recreation. So uh, diving, snorkeling, kayaking, you, you just go. We mark, we have about 48 uh, sites marked with mooring buoys, and we've really put a focus recently on the shallow water ones so kayakers and paddleboarders uh, can find them. There are um, businesses that will take you out or you can go on your own, yeah. Great, great question, yeah. So the same preservation um, that takes place with the artifacts also um, can take place with uh, organic materials and, and human remains. So there are, there are sites, many of these sites, there are, where there's a loss of life. And so we have found um, bones and other aspects on there. There are spe some special laws in Michigan that prevent the photogra photographing those and publishing them. And so it is an important reminder that these aren't just incredible feats of technology sitting down there. They're grave sites in many, many places. Um, in Lake Superior, there's actually been uh, uh, where it's the, the temperature's even colder. There has been actually bodies um, fully preserved. Yeah, yeah. Um, and here, Nate is much younger. Hi. I'm just going to. Oh. Oh, okay. Activity. Yeah. <laughs> um, how are you addressing the zebra mussels? Um, we are monitoring the zebra m millions and millions of dollars uh, by industry. So this zebra, the same infestation takes place in water intakes. Um, so for industry and, and the water systems for the communities, so tons of research has gone into how to control them. And um, there has not been a solution for that. So what we are doing is monitoring them, see how they're impacting, watching there's, there's over time from the 80s when they first kind of came in, uh, 
there's been kind of ebbs and flows of them where they come and, I don't want to say they go, but <laughs> things are um, less infested at times. There's now some evidence that some of the native fish, uh, particularly the trout and whitefish, are eating them, um, which sounds like a good thing, but the nutritional value of a zebra mussel, and I don't know that from experience, that's from scientific study, uh, is not there. And so the energy it takes for the fish to eat the mussel isn't paying off um, because a lot of the other bait fish are gone because the mussels have filtered out all of the microorganisms. So um, we're watching and we're hopeful there's a, another invasive species, the goby, uh, is eating them. So it's, it's interesting to see what's going to happen as the system balances, balances out. But I mean, um, there are images of beaches that are covered. I've, there's a wreck in uh, Lake Michigan I've been on where it's a very high energy area and the zebra mussels attach to the wreck and then they fall off and it's so many of them you can stick your arm in and it's just in the dead shells. I mean it's, it's shocking how many there are. So, and they have razor, my daughter has some stitches in her knee because <laughs> they're razor sharp. So, um, but um, they're not everywhere. They don't really in, go on sand, they, they more go to hard environments of so the lakes. They're still, they, the lakes aren't destroyed. I, I don't want to give a picture, you don't want to go in them. They're, they're, they're incredible, still incredible places. Hi, back here. Yep. So you had mentioned that there was a big turnaround in general support, but essentially, yes. from 70% to general support. And I was wondering if you could say how you effected that change. Um, I think that. One of those early slides would it, it talked about making connections to the resources, and so um, I think the, the, the divers knew about it, and they didn't really care because they were going to dive the sites anyways. But it was connecting to the school groups, connecting to the community, showing the economic value. Um, those things all slowly pay, played a part. And I should say, when you see an ROV competition with 40 teams in there, it started out with one. Our morning buoy, 40 buoys, it started out with one. And so it wasn't these giant things that turned it around, but it was the momentum we had. We were actually talking about this earlier today. When Dr. Ballard came to Alpena, and uh, I think that got the community's attention that said this, if a guy of that caliber would come to northern Michigan uh, and spend a significant amount of time and bring his research vessel there, that this has to be special. And then when that, pro, when that documentary aired on Discovery Channel, it just kind of got people's attention and I think have a little more pride in the resources that were there. And, um, and so many people knew there were wrecks there, but they didn't, we didn't have all these imagery at that point. We, had, uh, we just didn't have enough stuff. And as people could see this, the beauty of these and how spectacular they were, it slowly totally took hold. The other thing is that I think when the staff got there and we started working with the community and they could, you know, if they had a concern, there was someone they could come talk to helped as well. So. What uh, restrictions do you have on fishing, uh, specifically drawing? Uh, is that so there's, there's, there really isn't, I don't know where, oh, right, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the commercial fishing in the Great Lakes is all set nets, so there's not trawling that takes place. There is uh, some scientific trawling that takes place, and we work very closely with agencies that are doing that just to make sure they're avoiding wrecks. Nobody wants the trawler to go into the wreck. Everybody loses when that happens. And so by marking them with buoys, that's helped the fishermen quite a bit because our, our, our recreational fishermen like fish with downriggers, and they like to get as close to the wreck as possible. So the buoys help orientate them, and that's, that's helped as well. And so we work closely with uh, the, rec the charter fishermen as well. So, yeah. All right, we have time for one more right here. I believe you said there was a three mile limit that belonged to the state. In the ocean. So, uh, the Great Lakes does not have that. So, there's no federal land there. There's no federal land. So, the bottom lands are completely owned. Our current boundary goes from shoreline to the middle of the lake, which is, and then we take one more step, you're in Canada, one more fin kick, I guess, and you're in Canada. Um, so, but we're in the ocean. Many of our sanctuaries are 
are in federal and state waters, but that's what makes us a little bit unique. And so that this, we co-manage the sanctuary with the state of Michigan. All right, please come visit. It is a gorgeous place. You would love it. Um, look me up if you get there in June, July, or August, I recommend. September, October, too. So, all right, thank you.